Hi kids, remember getting your first Superman comic book and being disappointed when you read it because he didn't get kidnapped and sexually tortured? No. Me either. Pack your things, we're leaving. We're gonna talk about it though. No, I don't think I will. Yeah, that, that oh, works. I like All right, okay. All right move. moving on. Hey, what about Tulip? Happy New Year, everybody. Etep Okuyan back with you here from the place to be reviews right here with all of you. Yes, still got the Christmas tree up in the background. Uh, we're back out in the uh, living room setup now because kids back to school, wife's back to work. But hey, we got videos to make. We got pop culture stuff to cover. So ladies and gentlemen, have no fear over bounding into comics. DC Comics implies Superman, I have to put this in safe YouTube terms even though I don't want to, uh, explicitly uh, tortured, bad things happened to him while he was in captivity. Scene described as a commentary on how, quote, in America when bad things happen to people who are traditionally marginalized, there's this feeling of let's just move on. In terms of Superman, I don't see this as them meaning this towards Superman. This is... Superman is a symbol, and I was talking about this the other night with Tony, Superman is a symbol of Americana. He's so ingrained in our cultural DNA uh, from an entertainment perspective that's it's bled into regular everyday life. Even normies who don't follow superheroes know who Superman is. They know who Batman is. Superman, you know, and, and heroes of the like, you know, your, your most popular superheroes uh, in the world are... Spider-Man, Superman, and Batman. So they know who these guys are. They're familiar with some of their quotes and things they say, you know, gadgets, villains, things of the like, that have permeated the pop culture landscape, out of the pop culture landscape, and into the mainstream. So... To me, I look at this as an affront to everything that Superman stands for and an attack on him as a symbol of Americana because that's basically what these people, these culture vultures are doing. And that's a good, that's, I think we're just going to call them that from now on. They're culture vultures. They're deconstructing our mythologies, our beloved franchises for the sake of injecting this modern ideological, it's, it's just vapid. It's a vapid ideological state of mind that these people live in because they don't stand for anything. They, they stand for nothing. All they do is tear things down. As we all know, is a very weird way to live your life. And people might say, but Ita, you are a commentator on this kind of thing, and you, you know, frequently complain about things being, well, well, yeah, because I'm doing it from a place of, I love these franchises. I love Star Wars. I, I love the MCU for what it was. The MCU has been transformed into a message board for the creators, not, not a place for the fans who enjoy it to come and watch their favorite heroes, you know, fight the baddies. No, we have to have, you know, and there's always been ideological things in comics. Do they have to be done in a ham-fisted manner in one side? No, they used to go both way. If you are on the opposite side of the aisle from the people who, let's just face it, these insane leftists um, who want everything to be divisive, if you're on the opposite side of them, you're seen as the enemy, problematic, you know, a toxic, you know, that's that's the kind of th pejoratives they like to throw around. Uh, it, people like me, and it's it's weird. It's just it's just a weird way to live, uh, especially being a parent trying to raise his son and and teach him how to be a man. People are just they're culture vultures, and they they don't care. They're literally the parasites from Independence Day. They devour an IP, they ruin it for everybody, and then they move on to the next one. They never cared about it. It's like Star Wars. These these weirdos, these Raylos, the sequel trilogy fans, they don't care about Star Wars. They never cared about Star Wars. They cared about faux inclusivity and, diver and diversity, which has always been there organically, but they want the issue pressed. And in a property like Star Wars, for the main problem to be there's not enough people of color, you're talking a galaxy far, far away, all right? There doesn't have to be people at all. There can be aliens, and these aliens are going to be diverse in nature because they're fucking aliens. For them to say that it's not diverse because there's no people of color, there's no women, well, there doesn't have to be white people. There can be aliens. I don't care. I don't want to see white people everywhere I go. I feel like Tessa Thompson now. 
But that's not the case here. I want to see good entertainment. I don't care what the cast looks like, you know, as long as the cast makes sense to the story and their characters are well developed, that's all we ever cared about. That's all we ever cared about. And we've had awesome, amazing, strong female characters since I was a kid. But they want to act like nothing happened before 2016. So this is where we're at now. This is why we have to record these videos. This is why we have to have these discussions. This is why people like me and my brothers and sisters, the culture warriors, are fighting for our modern mythologies this way. Because we love these things. We hate seeing them bastardized by people who have no creativity. This is why it's so important that you support independent creators in our community because they're the ones that are bringing you what you want, what you ask for, what you're willing to give your hard-earned money for. People like Red Gaze, people like Vinny, people like Chris Fisk, people like Nerium, Phoenix Animation, everybody over at Black Rose Comics. There's so many creators in this community and big shout outs to all my friends that are independent creators, man. I support and back as many of your projects. Jeff Hicks, Oz that's on our show, all these folks, all these folks create things for you to enjoy. You just have to go out and spend your hard-earned money on like you would this mainstream stuff that spits in your face now instead of patting you on the back and saying thank you for supporting us. That's what you get from independent creators. They pat you on the back and say thank you for supporting us. We truly appreciate it because without you it wouldn't be possible. That's why these independent creators are so important in this culture war, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get into this article. This is just a sad picture of Superman. That, that is like... After that is this is Spencer Bakuli yesterday bonding into comics. Big shout out to Spencer. According to 12 years of slave screenplay writer turned author John Ridley, his decision to pen a story for DC Comics in which Superman is implied to have been sexually tortured during one of his previous Silver Age adventures was made in order to provide commentary on his perception that. The prevailing culture in this country is when bad things happen to people who are traditionally marginalized, there's this feeling of, okay, we get it, it was wrong, let's just move on. <laughs> Not everybody saying, let's just move on, but we need to move past it. Living in the past is only going to hinder progress, and I mean progress in a good sense. Healing, recovering, not handouts, not placating, not resegregating. That doesn't work. That's never worked. Segregating people from each other has never worked, and that's what this pandemic has done to us. It has segregated us, and even though social media and things like YouTube and Minds and all that, it, we can get together and we can talk, it's still, they still want us apart. They don't want us gathering together. Look at gatherings that aren't by the approved quote unquote minds who say always tell you trust the science until it comes to actual science of things like gender. It's ma'am. It is ma'am. Then the science be ignored. But when the science fits the narrative, you know, this and this is this just goes along with everything else. It's gaslighting, folks. You have gaslighting on a scientific front, on a cultural front, and that's where we're at now, on a political front. You know, ev ev gaslighting, gaslighting everywhere. Recently making the rounds on social media, Ridley's untitled tale features the first issue, the recent Superman Red and Blue anthology series, and serves as a continuation to a two-part story originally published in the 1970s, World's Finest, number 192-193, where the Man of Steel and the Dark Knight were held prisoner in a death camp run by the state's Soviet dictator, Colonel Kozlov. Written by Bob Haney and illustrated by Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito, the original story sees Colonel Kozlov capture Superman first by staging a false flag train derailment to lure him into the country, and then, with the Man of Steel distracted, depowering him with a targeted bombardment of synthetic kryptonite radio wave. After attempting to sneak his way out of Kozlov's clutches, running into a number of Lubanian soldiers dressed like the Dark Knight as part of a psyop along the way, Superman stumbles upon Batman who reveals that he came to the Soviet country in order to investigate his friend's disappearance. Unfortunately, the two are then caught by Kozlov himself, who then throws the titular world's finest into Lubania's infamous death camps. This is exactly what they would like to... This is kind of projection that they bring this story back up now because this is what they'd like to do to people who dissent. Look at Australia. From there, Superman and Batman are seen being subjected to the various cruelties of the Soviet Union's prison system in an attempt to break their spirits, including hard labor, starvation, and humiliation for nothing more than the guards' enjoyment. Yes, comrade. You are funny. Now go to Gulag. The conditions are shown to be particularly mentally taxing on Superman, who is as observed by Batman, was not prepared as I am for this kind of treatment. Eventually, the heroes devise a plan to switch costumes, thus misleading Kozlov's kryptonite waves into being directed at Batman, allowing Superman to slowly regain his powers. Liar! Soon after Superman returns to full strength, the pair escape and return to Washington, leaving a disgraced Kozlov to fall victim to the very death camp 
he once oversaw. You are one pathetic loser. Returning to Lubania as Clark, under the auspices of interviewing Kozlov for the Daily Planet, Superman, seeking to conduct his own personal form of therapy, asked the taxi driver to make a stop at the former prison on his way to the one-sided reunion. Slowly making his way through the now-defunct facility, Superman then begins to reminisce on his time as Kozlov's captive. I was held for eight months, he recalls. Eight months of starvation, indoctrination, and forced labor. Eight months of being used as a propaganda tool to prove the weakness of the West. But I'm Superman, right? Superman's invulnerable. Superman can survive anything. That was the lie I told myself every night. It is here that Ridley appears to put a darker, more violent spin on Superman's time in captivity. One neither seen nor hinted at in the original story, but rather only assumed as the possibility due to the real-world implications of its setting as Clark turns to confront his own implied sexual torture at the hands of Kozlov's men. His memory, showing him restrained in a bent-over position and screaming out in pain, what the dialogue suggests to be some combination of both outright grape... Bring out the gimp. Uh, use of foreign objects on him, we'll say. Clark continues, but every day, every day they would drag me into the interview room. Every day they would restrain me in a way that left me exposed and vulnerable. And every day for eight months, they, they did things to me. This is a man writing about Superman. Okay, so if if I'm a young writer and I'm I get gifted ability to create like this and, and write stories, the last thing that I'm thinking in my mind is. You know what will really show these people who say we need to get over the dirty past of the United States? You know what we'll, I'll do to show them? I'll, I'll have Superman graped in my story. That's what I'll do. That's exactly what this person is doing. That's exactly what this quote-unquote writer is doing. They're trying to make you, the reader, feel guilty for who you are. No matter what color you are, if you are a fan of Superman, they want you to feel bad for who you are, what Superman represents, truth, justice, and the American way. That's why they changed it to truth, justice, and some other dumb shit that I don't care about. Something along the lines of progress, progressive, whatever. But that's why they changed it, because God knows that if you're American, you should feel guilty inherently because of the country having blood on its hands in its past. You show me a country that doesn't, ladies and gentlemen. They did things to me while I was forced to look at him, Nikolai Kozlov, the commander of the Shervanaz, the devil of Lubania, he adds. It wasn't just the torture. Kozlov showed me what it was like to be truly without power, helpless in a way Luther or Brainiac never made me feel. Humiliated. Shame. I mean, look at this. This is pathetic. Walking back to the cab, Clark makes his way to his interview, meeting Kozlov at a restaurant for lunch. Faking interest through a conversation of the former dictator's current business empire, Clark eventually gets to his only real point of interest. Did he have any remorse for all the thousands who died at his camp? Did he care? Tell me more. Look like a In the end, Kozlov was neither reformed nor remorseless. He dismissed my question, saying that many people had made mistakes during the Cold War years. The West had won, and all any of us could do was move on. However, Clark is left unsatisfied with the response, concluding to himself, it's easy to move on when you're the victimizer and not the victim. Shortly after its publication, Ridley opened up about his choice to explore this dark period in Superman's history during an interview with CBR. Asked by Bickham if there was a particular reason he chose to focus on a moment in his life when he was the most vulnerable, Ridley replied, what makes heroes most interesting to me is when you can see their vulnerability and their humanity. <laughs> I'm going to call bullshit on this one. Come on, don't bullshit me. And I'm going to say he just wanted to emasculate a piece of Americana to get his ideological perspective injected into this. Comics are still for children, right? So we need to explain this to kids now why Superman's getting graped. It doesn't make any sense to me. Just as a writer, one of the things that's really challenging, whether it's film or TV or graphic novels, is that sense of false jeopardy when you know nothing's going to happen to this hero. So you go through the entire story and end up essentially where you began, he explained. You know Bruce is not going away. Clark is not going away. Diane is not going away. Oliver's not going away. They just can't, you know? People love them. They sell comic books. They sell t-shirts. They sell mugs. So what's the easiest way to piss people off? Make Superman get graped? He continued, so you get it. You know you have to write these stories that are exciting, but they have to remain. But as me, for a writer, irrespective of whether it's comic books, TV, or movies, it dissipates some of the storytelling when you have that false jeopardy. You get that cliffhanger at the end of a book. You know everything's going to turn out all right. So for me, any time you can see heroes as people where there's pain, where there's loss, where there are things they can't control, where they're made to feel human, where they doubt themselves, there's also an element of real life there, the writer added. Now I understand that so much comic books is about wish fulfillment. 
I don't want to take any of that away, but as part of wish fulfillment for me, it's not about so super that being so super that you're impervious, but being so human that being part of an extraordinary is just getting past some of your own fear and Yada, yada, yada. This guy wants to project his own his own bullshit onto Superman, is what he's doing. That's that's his goal, is to project his own bullshit onto Superman. Ridley then drew equations between his depiction of Clark's vulnerability and the conditions experienced by healthcare workers and delivery drivers during the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> Telling Bickham, I think that just as a person in the real world, we've gone through a year and a half of fear and anxiety. Oh, what the fuck ever? Fear and anxiety driven by the media and politician. But as we come out of it, we see the people who are really extraordinary, the doctors, the nurses, and the delivery people who brought us our food. Before we dismiss them as nobodies, we need to realize they're heroes. No, you're a hero if you live your life. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not discounting the efforts of healthcare workers and doctors and delivery drivers and all that. But what I am saying is, I've lived my life without fear for the past two years of this. I've had COVID. My wife had COVID. My kid had COVID. You know what we did? We relied on natural immunities and we got the fuck over it. This whole, oh, well, we, we fear and anxiety. Yeah, because you sit there and you watch the media 24 seven and they're gonna lead you to believe the sky is falling when indeed it's not. You have to remember where your information is coming from when it comes to the media. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble. So to me, that's part of the storytelling, the author said. And that was a big reason why I think the story, even when I was a kid, was compelling to me. Because it was different than a typical Superman story. The stories that are interesting to me are the stories where you get these characters that are human and you can see that humanity. To me, that is as interesting and that is the challenge, he asserted. It's not a challenge when Superman can do anything, but it becomes a challenge when he can't do anything but still chooses to do the right thing. <laughs> In conclusion of the interview, Bickham drew Ridley's attention to the above quote. It's easy to move on when you're the victimizer and not the victim and ask the author, what was the inspiration behind that quote? That is my perspective about prevailing culture in this country, Ridley responded. When bad things happen to people who are traditionally marginalized, there's this feeling of, okay, we get it, it was wrong, let's just move on. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. If you want to play victim your whole life, then you're going to live in a state of perpetual depression and that victim mentality not conducive to a healthy life. He further opined, you can see that just over the last year or even in this year with things that have happened on January 6th, there are a lot of people who are like, yeah, okay, we get it. It's bad. Let's just move on. They want to talk about January 6th, but they want to totally sweep the entire summer of love of 2020 where cities were burning, people were looting uh, in the name of Majustice, which was a false narrative to begin with. But it's like, no, you can't just move on. There are things that need to be worked through and things that need to be acknowledged and dealt with, he pushed back. It was very important for me to represent that with Superman. Even though we see him as Superman, he needed a moment where he could just move on from it. No, that was your way of getting revenge. With trauma, sometimes you have to look at it and that's okay, he remarked Ridley. Whether it's societal trauma, whether it's personal trauma, I think sometimes in life we feel like we have to be happy today. It's great if you can be happy. I wish happiness on everyone every day, but sometimes we have to slow down and go, okay, today's not a good day and this is why. Let me deal with that and let me work through it my way. It's going to hurt, you know? It's a natural human thing. He was a retard. Drawing his thoughts to a close, Ridley declared to Bickham, hurt and trauma are regular normal emotions. They need to be acknowledged, he stated. We need to understand that it's never good when people hurt, but it's okay to hurt because that's an acknowledgement that there's something going on and people need to deal with. And we need to help people deal with that hurt, trauma, or whatever they're going through. People need to work through their own issues because that's the only way they're going to get through them properly. So there it is, folks. What do you think of Ridley's story? What do you think of his take on Superman? What do you think of his treatment of the Man of Steel. Do you think this is a lot of internalized projection and hatred and vitriol coming out of a writer who's so untalented and so mentally stunted and so perpetually soaked in victim mentality that this is the best effort he can muster as far as writing a Man of Steel story? It's your turn. Let me know in the comments below. I thank all of our subscribers, ladies and gentlemen. You are the reason that we do this. Please remember, smack that like button for us. If today's the day I've earned it and you choose to press the button and subscribe to the channel, remember, turn the bell on for notifications. That way you're notified every time that we go live or upload a new video. And be sure to come back tonight and join us at 835 Eastern for Monday Night Going in Raw with myself, Tony Tone Depp, Vinny Tartamella, and the Assistant Regional Manager, Red Gaze. 
Until then, I'm Etep Okuit of The Place to Be Reviews. I've been here with all of you. If I don't see you, have a great day, a pleasant tomorrow. I'll catch you on the next one. Remember, I could do